Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 18. For you were formerly for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not partake in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, awake sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. This is the word of God. So, brothers and sisters, today we're going to be talking about, it's kind of like a, a little bit coming from the book of Ephesians, but it's also a little bit of a topical sermon. So, uh, I want to start off with uh, just what Janine read in Ephesians chapter 5. So, Paul, once again, if you've been kind of trekking with us and following us, he's giving a lot of commands. So, he's saying, in light of what Jesus has done, this is how we should live. So, he's saying, you've got to imitate God. You have to walk in love. Let there be no hint of even sexual or morality in yourself or in your relationships with other people. Remember your identity, that you are light. You are a child of God. You are not a child of darkness. So stop living in darkness. And then he talks to some Christians who are sleeping. They've been spiritually sleeping. And he says, awake, wake up, because you need to stop sleeping. And then he says, because the days are evil, so you need to be wise, and you need to know what God's will is. And I think this is where Paul kind of, he stops what he's writing and he realizes, I just gave the Ephesian church like a whole bunch of commands. And commands are really hard to obey. It's really hard to do a whole bunch of things that God is telling you. So he kind of stops and he says, I think I need to kind of teach them how to obey these commands. So he says, you got to have a heart of gratitude. You got to understand kind of the anger of God, the angry love of God. You got to understand your identity. And then he come, comes to the last part and says, these commands that I'm giving you is impossible to obey. These commands that I'm giving you are impossible to fill out, to, to live out, unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so today, and you know, kind of in light of what I talked about at Pentecost, because I think that sermon at Pentecost kind of brought up a lot of questions and Uh, People were saying, I never heard a sermon on the Holy Spirit before. So what I wanted to do today was to actually talk about the Holy Spirit. And who is the Holy Spirit? What does he do? Uh, Why is it so important for us to uh, honor the Holy Spirit? And things like that. So I wanted to start off this way. So Jesus, he was on earth just basically uh, with a a group of disciples that he's been training and preparing for three years. Now, these guys have spent so much time together, most likely they're spending every day together. They're they're spending every day together, Jesus with the disciples, to a point where they became a spiritual family. They became really close. And I think these disciples, they looked at Jesus kind of like as a spiritual father. And they really wanted to be close to Jesus and walk with Jesus, and they, they, they were just really in intimate union with Jesus. And then Jesus looks at them in this incredibly close relationship that he has with his disciples, and then he says, I need to go away. I'm actually leaving you. Now imagine how shocking that is. Someone that you really put all your hope and faith and trust and intimacy, someone you really love and you care for, someone that's like as close to you, if not closer than your physical family, And then he says, I'm going away. Like, how do you think that's going to impact you? And then Jesus says, the reason why I'm going away is because it's good for you. How does that make sense? Jesus says, I need to go away because it's good for you. Why? Well, Jesus says this in John chapter 16, verse 7. He says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. It's actually good for you that I leave. Why? Why is it good that Jesus leaves? For if I do not go away... The helper, just another word for the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send them to you. So Jesus loves the disciples so much, wants the best for the disciples, cares for the disciples, has been training and equipping them, and he said, the best thing that I could do is to leave because what's better than me 
is actually the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. You see how important the Holy Spirit is? Right? Do you see how important the Holy Spirit is to the life of the church and to the life of the individual Christian? So just kind of laying some foundations and some groundworks, who is the Holy Spirit? The Bible clearly says that the Holy Spirit is God. He's God. So, you know, in Acts chapter 5, Peter is talking to Ananias and he says, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. So Peter says to Ananias, he goes, you lie to the Holy Spirit, who's God? So even Jesus says this. Jesus says, when you baptize people, you got to baptize them into the name of God because now they're followers of God. So in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of God. So what's the name of God? How do we baptize them? And Jesus says, here's the name of God, the name of the Father, of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Right? So Holy Spirit is God. Can I get an amen on that? He's God, right? And if he's God, that means he is deserving of honor, he is deserving of glory, and he is deserving of worship, right? He's God. But the problem is, you know, there's some people who kind of see the Holy Spirit not on equal with God the Father and Jesus. They kind of see the Holy Spirit as kind of like the opening act to like the famous musician. Like the Holy Spirit is the opening act to Jesus, Taylor Swift, right? Like that's the Holy Spirit is. You know, I remember this one guy, he said to me, this one pastor, uh, he said, the Holy Spirit is like Jesus' promoter, right? Jesus' club promoter. Now, some of you, you don't understand that because you've never been to a club, but others of you, you remember very well what I'm talking about, right? So the Holy Spirit, his job is to walk into a club and, you know, it's like, okay, everybody, get your hands up, get your hands up, you know? Everybody get your hands up, you know? Everybody get your hands, why is your hands not <laughs> Right? Get your hands up. Everybody get your hands up, right? Why? Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And then Jesus walks in. Everybody's like, whoa, Jesus, right? You know, Jesus comes in with all his chains. Like, you know, basically, right? right? So that's how people see the Holy Spirit. And that's wrong. Because Holy Spirit is equal in honor and glory and power and in essence with God the Father and Jesus Christ. Right? That's who the Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit is God. Now, the Holy Spirit is not just God, but he's a person. Because some people, they say, oh, he's like a force. It's like the spiritual force. Or some people say, oh, he's a ghost. Because, you know, uh, old school language, they used to call him the Holy Ghost, which is actually not a good translation. But they say, oh, he's like a ghost. No, Holy Spirit is not a force. Holy Spirit is not a ghost. But he's a person. How do you, how do you define a person? A person is someone with mind and emotions and will. And when you look at the Bible, you see that the Holy Spirit has mind and emotion and will. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit has a mind. He thinks. The Holy Spirit has a will. He makes decisions. The Holy Spirit personally makes decisions, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as we will. So, so the Holy Spirit makes the decision. In this context, the Holy Spirit is the one who, with his mind, decides, I'm going to give you this gift, I'm going to give you this gift, I'm going to give you this gift, and I'm going to give you this gift. He makes the decision. He has a will. And the Holy Spirit is someone who has emotions. So the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force where it, it, it just doesn't feel anything, but he's a person. So it says in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? And I know we're kind of, you know, starting from the, you know, the base level, but we need to build this up so that we can all have a proper understanding of who the Holy Spirit is so that we may give him all the honor and glory and praise. But the Holy Spirit is God, deserving of honor and glory and worship along with Jesus, along with God the Father. And the Holy Spirit is a person with a mind and emotion and will. Okay, so how does the Holy Spirit 
relate to us. So what kind of relationship does the Holy Spirit want to have with each and every one of us that believe in Jesus, that confess his name? Okay? So um, the two primary ways that the Holy Spirit wants to relate to us, the two primary ways is the Holy Spirit wants to indwell us and the Holy Spirit wants to fill us. So that's the Holy Spirit's heart. That's what he wants to do. When you, when you kind of study the scriptures and when you look at what the Bible has to say, the Bible says the Holy Spirit wants to dwell inside of us and the Holy Spirit wants to fill us. And that's the type of ministry the Holy Spirit wants to have. So let's look at that. The Holy Spirit wants to dwell us. So the Holy Spirit is the indwelling presence of God in our hearts. Paul writes in Romans, he said, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So Paul literally places the location of the spirit and he says the location of the spirit is inside of you. And what's really crazy is somebody said, well, why is it so important that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of me? Many reasons, okay? But if you look at this text, one of the reasons is to give you life. The Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. How crazy is that? The Holy Spirit is the one who took a dead Jesus and brought him back to life. And what Paul is saying is, Paul is saying the Holy Spirit that's living in you can give you life like he gave life to Jesus. Amen? Isn't that cool? Right? So if you need life, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you life. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Guard through the Holy Spirit, once again, who dwells inside of you, dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So brothers and sisters, I want you to know, each and every one of you, if you believe in Jesus today, you invited him as your Savior, you invited him as your Lord, the Holy Spirit who is God is permanently indwelling within you. Amen? Right? Permanently. And the reason why I say that is because there's some Christians who are so insecure about that. So um, there's some Christians from, uh, from the Pentecostal tradition, highly hyper-charismatic tradition, where they feel like they're constantly losing the Holy Spirit. So, so what they do is, they, uh, every altar call, they go up to receive Jesus because they need the Holy Spirit back. Now, I know some of you from like conservative traditions, you're like, that makes no sense to me. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things that the conservative tradition do that the charismatic tradition looks at them and goes, oh, that makes no sense to me. So, you know, we're trying to look at both sides. But, you know, so uh, there might be some of you that are like, oh, I've lost the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has departed from me. You know, the Holy Spirit is no longer with me. That's not true. That's not what the Bible's saying. If you have accepted in Jesus as the Savior and Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit is permanently indwelling inside of you. Amen? Isn't that cool? Okay. All right. Uh, here's the problem. The Holy Spirit has a personality, right? He's a person. So the Holy Spirit, the character of the Holy Spirit is he's very quiet. The character of the Holy Spirit is he's very gentle. This is just me, okay? But if I had to say out of the three person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is the one who is the introvert. He's the introverted member of the Trinity. I like him. Okay, if you're introverts, we have someone who understands us. Okay? He's quiet. He's gentle. He's easy to ignore. Right? He's easy to pass by. He's easy to resist. So because the personality of the Holy Spirit is quiet, and the personality of the Holy Spirit is gentle. And because it's so easy to ignore him, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit can live quietly inside of us, grieved and quenched, because we ignore him. Ephesians 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19, do not quench the spirit. Quench the spirit. Quench means there's this flame and you lower that flame to now it's a flickering ember. And what 
these commands that Paul is giving to the people of God is, it's possible. You can quench the spirit. You can resist the spirit. You can ignore the spirit to a point where the spirit is now grieved and quenched. And when you look at the tenor of scripture, ignoring the Holy Spirit, which is so easy to do sometimes, leads to insensitivity to the Holy Spirit, which leads to what the Bible says, the hardening of the heart to the Holy Spirit. That's why it says in the book of Hebrews, do not harden your hearts when the Spirit of God calls you. So, brothers and sisters, is this you? To a point where you're sitting here today and you feel like the Holy Spirit is absent from your heart. You see, the Holy Spirit is not absent from your heart, but because maybe you've quenched him and resisted him and ignored him, maybe it feels like to you that he is not inside of you because you've become insensitive and hardened to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. But here's the good news. Even when we are insensitive to the Holy Spirit, we resist him, we grieve him, we quench him, the Holy Spirit, out of his incredible love for us and commitment to us, he will never leave us. Amen? He will never, ever leave us. That's true love. That's how much he loves you. That in the midst of us treating the Holy Spirit in insensitivity and in ignorance, the Holy Spirit will never, ever leave us. He will never, ever forsake us. So, how do we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit? How can we become sensitive to this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that's very quiet and that's very gentle, that's kind of, in some ways, unassuming, that's easy to ignore? Well, the simple answer is we have to acknowledge him. And that's what Paul says in Romans. He says, you got to set your mind. Because the problem is you can't set your mind on everything. So Paul says, you have a choice. You can set your mind on the flesh or you can set your mind on the spirit. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So there's people who set their minds on flesh, not on the spirit. So they ignore the spirit, they grieve the spirit, they quench the spirit, they resist the spirit. Maybe not even intentionally, but the spirit is not where their mind is set on. But then it says there are those who set their minds according to the spirit. So their mind, they, they're acknowledging the spirit the things of the Spirit. So, so there's this sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. You know what's really crazy is, uh, you, know, I, uh, you know, since we're at Romans, Romans chapter 7 is talking about the Christian that has been bound by sin. Romans chapter 7 is talking about the person where they're a Christian, but they're so bound by sin, they're like, what a wretched man I am. Who's going to rescue me from this you know, body of sin? And then Romans chapter 8 First verse, it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it says, Jesus has forgiven you of all of your sins. And then you're like, praise the Lord. Jesus has forgiven me of all of my sins. And then you know what the rest of Romans, they talk about? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So you know what it means? It means in this midst of this struggle with sin that you have, Jesus forgives you, but the Holy Spirit empowers you so that you can live a life that is free from sin. Can I get amen on that? Right? So... That's a, you know, if we, st if we ever did our series through Romans, that would be the message for Romans 8, right? <laughs> right? So that's basically what it is. So you got to set your mind. So it says the result. For the mind set on the flesh is death. You die to the presence and the sensitivity to the life that the Holy Spirit wants to give to you. So you are saved, but you don't feel that. There's no life. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, right? So uh, how do we apply this? I remember uh, several years back, Pastor Keith was talking about the Holy Spirit and he said, like how we ignore the Holy Spirit and he gave an example, he goes, you know, when you wake up in the morning and the alarm goes off, what's the first thing you reach for? What, what's the first thing most of us reach for? We reach for our phones, right? You know? So, and then we reach for our phones, and then we kind of, you know, go through our email, our, you know, whatever, whatever, our news. And then he said this. He said, rather than reaching for your phone, maybe the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge the Holy Spirit by saying, good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. So, uh, I share that. 
I remember I was at a, I think at an encounter retreat and I actually shared that. I said, hey, you know, I, I want to encourage you guys to do something. I want to encourage you guys, like when you wake up in the morning, rather than reaching for your phone, to say, good morning, Holy Spirit. And um, uh, like a week later, this guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, Pastor Richard, I did what you said. And I was surprised because I think no one does what I say. <laughs> right? Just feel like, you know, some sermons I preach and I'm like, what was that about? Right? So I was like, wow. I was like, you did what I said? By the way, you know how you can encourage me? <laughs> right? Do what I say. <laughs> From the Bible. From the Bible. That would be the greatest encouragement to me. Apostle John says in his letters, he goes, that brings me no joy than to see my children walking in the truth. Right? So he said, I did what you said. I said, what I say? <laughs> I said many things. <laughs> and then he said, I decided when I wake up, rather than grabbing my phone, I decided to say, good morning, Holy Spirit. And he said, the first time I did that, and this is just his personal experience, he said he felt electricity just shoot up his arm. And then he said, wow. And he said, I've been doing it ever since, and the trajectory of my day has changed because I started by acknowledging the Holy Spirit. Right? Simple. Right? You know, that's why I do quiet time. You know why I do quiet time? You know, when I was younger, I used to do quiet time because I just wanted to know more about God. So it wasn't really quiet time, it was just Bible study. Or I, I did quiet time because like this weird thought I had that if I don't pray for these people, then something bad's going to happen to them or they're not going to get blessed. So I have to pray for my kids, right? If I don't pray for my kids that day, something bad's going to happen to the kids, right? And then one time I didn't pray for my kids. I'm like, no, no. And then they're like, today was the greatest day ever, right? <laughs> right? It's because grace of God. Amen? God loves our kids more than we do, right? It's not up to us. So you know why I do quiet time now? I do quiet time because I know the personality of the Spirit. I know I can't hang out with the Holy Spirit at a party. You ever hang out with the introvert at a party? Right? It don't work, man. Introverts need one-on-one -on -one time. Right? You want to get to know me? Meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I can do <laughs> Right? So what do I do? My quiet time is one-on-one -on -one time. And then I meet with the Holy Spirit and I say, Holy Spirit, good morning. And I know you're gentle. I know you're quiet. I know you're that still, small voice. You don't speak in the lightning, the fire, and the thunder, the earthquake. I know you speak to me quietly in a whisper. So I want to quiet my heart so that I could hear your voice. And when I fellowship with him, I don't know. I just feel this like, connection that's so beautiful. So that's the indwelling presence of the Spirit. What's next? Holy Spirit fills us. So Holy Spirit doesn't just indwell us, Holy Spirit fills us. Which is interesting, because this is where like, the Holy Spirit kind of becomes like an extrovert. <laughs> right? Like, you know, like Holy Spirit's like gentle and quiet, and one day he's like, you know? You know? So what, what does that mean? What, what does it mean? So uh, we see this in Scripture. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And, and this is where I want to focus on. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled. There was a filling. And, and when you read through the rest of the book of Acts, there's a constant question. Have you been filled with the Spirit? Have they been filled with the Spirit? Are you filled with the Spirit? You believe, but are you filled with the Spirit? It's like literally, like, this is like, like the apostles considered the filling of the Spirit to be so important and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So what is the filling of the Spirit? What does that mean? How do we know? How do we know when someone is filled with the Spirit? Now, this is actually, could be a, a whole core seminary class. I could be like, there's 30 different ways that scripture says that the Holy Spirit fills you. And, you know, if I had like, I don't know, five days with you, uh, I would love to do that. But, you know, this is a sermon. This is not a seminary lecture. So I, I can only kind of highlight a couple things. So I just want to give you four major ways 
four major effects that the filling of the Holy Spirit happens. Or, or how do we know? Uh, what is the filling? How, how do I know that I'm, oh, like, oh, I'm being filled with the Spirit? How, how do I know this? So four major ways. There's more than this, but I just want to talk about these four. First is this. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the undeniable experience of God's presence and love. Okay, so that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you, you're like, I feel the presence of God, but more than the presence of God, you feel the love of God. You feel the love of God. You get to experience the full reality of God the Father's love for you. You see, uh, when you look at the scriptures, the scriptures say that we have the status of being children of God. So we have the status. Uh, by the virtue of Jesus' death and resurrection and the Father's great love for us and the right that he has given us, he has given us the right to be called children of God. That is a status. We have the status. But when you look at other parts of, this, of the scriptures, that status has to be experienced. So there's experience and there's status. Or our spirits become dry, we become bored, we focus on other things, and, and, and we kind of drift away from God. So how do I explain this? Um, there was this Puritan long time ago, I think his name was Thomas Watson, and he said that he saw a father and a son walking down the street. And as he saw the father and the son walking down the street, he saw the father just turn toward the son and give the son a big hug. And as he gave the son a big hug, afterwards they stopped and then they just kept walking. And Thomas Watson, he, he saw that and he asked the question, he said, when the father hugged the son, did the son become more of a son because he got to experience the father hugging him? And he said, no. He didn't become more of a son. But what happened at the moment where the father hugged him was that the son got to experience the status of being a child of God or child of the father, right? Right? he got to experience his father's love, right? You know, parents, would you ever say to your kids, you know, if, you know, if they're like, you know, uh, dad, right? Dad, I love, you know, dad, can you, you know, uh, are you my father? Of course I am. You see the birth certificate, right? Hey, birth certificate. You were born at Kaiser Anaheim, don't you know? Right? You have my last name, don't you know? Like, who would ever say that? What do you do? You hug them. You hold them, and they get to experience the status of what it means to be your child. You see, that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is when you get to experience the love of God. What else? The filling of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do God's work. The filling of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do God's work. You know, brothers and sisters, you ever wonder why you serve so hard, work so hard, and nothing happens, or there's little fruit, or you burn out? You know, when I, the main reason why people burn out in the church is because they're not doing it in the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit, but instead they're doing it in their own strength. That's why people burn out. People, you don't burn out because it's too hard, it's too tiring. You don't burn out because, you know, people are hard to get along with. You don't burn out because people hurt you. Those are not the main reasons why you burn out. The reason why you burn out is because you've been trying to do what, what, what you wanted to do uh, without the filling of the Holy Spirit. Instead, you want to do it in your power. So you serve God in your effort, your hard work, your personality, your skills, your talent, your wisdom, and not in the Holy Spirit's power. Not in the Holy Spirit's power. So this is why, you know, like, you know, some people come to me and they're like, oh, you know, that guy's so talented. That guy's so gifted. Oh, look at that guy. You know, that guy's so eloquent. That guy's so intelligent. Oh, that guy works so hard. You know what? I don't care about any of that. Stop telling me about those things, right? You tell me about those things, that does nothing in my mind to elevate that guy and make me want to make him a leader. None of it. You know what I care about? That guy is filled with the Spirit. That guy is filled with the Holy Spirit. That guy seeks the Holy Spirit to walk with the Holy Spirit, cares about the Holy Spirit. Why? Because here's the thing, and, and this is our biggest problem. Good intention plus human effort. Good intention plus human effort leads to no fruit or bitter fruit or no long-lasting fruit. And for some of us, we believe in Jesus, we honor the Father, but we do all these good things these good intention thing with our hard work without the filling and the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
So that's our problem. For some of us, you know, uh, the way we raise our kids, right? You have such good intentions. You love your children. You care for them. You want what's best for them. So you want to give your best to your kids. So you have these good intentions and you work so hard with your wisdom, your resources, your intelligence, your experience, your love, your care. And then 10 years later, kids don't turn out well. And you're like, what happened? What? And by the way, brothers and sisters, I see lots of that. That's why I'm talking about it. Like, what happened? I had such good intentions. I love my children. I, you know, we used all our resources, all our money, you know, uh, uh, all our training. You know, I, I was like an Uber driver. I'm like shuttling them back and forth. I sacrificed literally 10 years. You know, we sacrificed our marriage. We did all this and our kids turned out bad. What happened? Well, you know what happened? No fruit, bitter fruit, no long lasting fruit because none of that in, in, in that whole course were you led and filled by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit loves your children more than you, amen? Right? So why, like, good intentions is not enough. Hard work, wisdom, guidance, none of that is long enough. Some of us, you know, we're like, you know what? Um, I don't need God right now. I need to really focus on my career. Like, you know, I need to establish myself before I come to God. Those people, 10, 20 years later, they look at their jobs and they just want to quit and they hit their lives. What's that? They built their careers. They built their future on what? Good intentions. They had good intentions, right? There, there's, you know, you have good intentions. And then so they use all their energy, all their effort, all their strength, and they look back and they're like, this is bitter fruit. Right? Pastors do this. Pastors work really hard, read lots of books. You know, they go to leadership conferences. They do this, they do that, right? And then they have good intentions. They genuinely actually love the people and their churches fail. Why is that? Because they're not led, nor empowered, nor filled by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves the church more than we do. The Holy Spirit loves your future, loves your vision more than you do. The Holy Spirit loves your children more than you do. The Holy Spirit alone knows the way to abundant life. But the problem is we trust our good intentions and we trust our human effort more than the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus means when he says that you are building your house on sand. You are building your house on sand. You, 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 you work so hard. The house is beautiful. The house is beautiful, man. You're like, it's filled with your love. It's filled with your efforts. It's filled with your resources. That house is going to sink because it's built on sand. And here's the promise. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, you can do great works, great works. Why? Because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. That's the filling of the Spirit. The, holding of, uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit, also number three, gives us the strength to obey God. Gives us the strength to obey God. Uh, have you noticed that when you became a Christian, some sins were easy to give up? Have you noticed that? That when you became a Christian, some sins you struggled with just, like, you can just lay it aside. Have you noticed other sins? You've been a Christian 10, 20 years and you still have it? Why is that? Like, when I became a Christian, some sins, easy to get rid of. Other sins, it was hard. Why is that? Well, because the sins that were easy to get rid of, the reason why is because of your background, your upbringing, your culture, the values that were set was actually positioned properly so that those were easy to get rid of. But other sins, because of your background, your upbringing, your culture, kind of the influence that you had, it's harder to get rid of. So we think, oh, these sins are going to stay with us for the rest of our lives. And certain commands that God wants us to obey, we can't obey it for the rest of our lives. It just stuck with us. We're just going to go to our grave in the sin. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. The filling of the Holy Spirit Spirit actually gets rid of those sins. The filling of the Holy Spirit actually empowers you to obey those commands. There's many people who have experienced this complete breakthrough that happens because they have been constantly over the period of their lives been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 5. As he's giving all these commands, he knows some churches, some Christians can obey, command, obey some commands, other Christians can't. And what Paul says is, hey, to obey these commands, you need the filling of the Holy Spirit. Right? Fourth, 
The filling of the Holy Spirit gives us crystal clear clarity about God's will and purpose. Crystal clear clarity about God's will and purpose. You see, most of us are enslaved to the urgent. If you did, uh, you know, if you did an audit of your life, if you did an audit of your past like a few weeks and months, you would realize that majority of the decisions you made, majority of the things you did was because of some sort of influence uh, that created urgency or pressure from people around you or from some sort of internal value that you have where you're like, I, I really have to do this. So you're just led by, enslaved by the urgent, okay? And, and, and what happens is the problem is you're like on this hamster wheel. So, so you, know, you're, you know, the Bible says there's a path that's laid out for you. They call it the path of righteousness. This is the path that you're supposed to walk to live the abundant life that God wants you to. So as, as, you know, as you're going through there, you know, uh, like the urgent, right? Pressure. So, you know, it's like, oh, shoot, you know, uh, someone's telling me to. So you go this way. Oh, shoot, someone's telling me to go this way. Oh, shoot, internal value. I got to go this way. And then what you're doing is the enemy is creating this like ugly cycle where you're on a hamster wheel. So rather than walking the path of life, you're, you're on this hamster wheel just going, you know, just constantly going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until your life ends. So you have eternal life, but you don't live abundant life. Why is that? Because you're constantly pulled back and forth by people, your own self. You know, the enemy's attacks to a point where you can't walk that path of righteousness to live the life that God has called you to. So, um, you know, there's this movie called The Matrix, and I think it's the third one. And uh, uh, they're on this ship, and they're going to attack the enemy uh, stronghold. And, you know, they're on the ship, and, you know, the enemy's attacking them. It's, like, dark. Uh, the ship starts shake, uh, shaking. There's, like, this storm, and... Um, you know, it's just really bad, like they're getting hurt, and they're distracted, they're anxious, they're afraid, they're scared, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the female driver, she goes, let's go up. So they go up. You guys, you guys remember this movie, right? So they go up, and they're going up and up and up. They break through the clouds, and once they break through the clouds, it's like light and peace. Like, you know, it's like, you know, calm, it's quiet. And then I remember uh, this, you know, uh, I remember uh, this, this character, she says, right when they broke through, and it's like this calm, clear, quiet, uh, beautiful, peaceful scenery. And, and the first words out of her mouth was like, wow. Wow. Right? And I remember when I saw that, I was like, that's Holy Spirit. Because so many times we're driven by the urgent. We're driven by pressure from other people, pressure on ourselves, pressure that the enemy holds on to. And we never get that crystal clear clarity of God's purpose for us. You know, that's, that's why I do my quiet time. That's why I meet with the Lord. Because, you know, when you're a pastor, when you're a leader, everybody has something to say. Everybody has something to say. Everybody has an idea. And, and let me say this. And most of the ideas are good. But just because it's good doesn't mean it's good. Right? Everybody, oh, you know, Pastor, have you considered this? Have you considered that? Pastor, have you considered this? Did you see that problem? Did you do this? Did you? And then, you know, I'm like, ah, right? You know what I do? I go into my place. I meet with the Holy Spirit. By the grace of God, he fulfills me. He fills me. And then somewhere in that time, I go, this is it. This is the way to go. This is what we have to do. So I come out at the time, I'm like, no, 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 no. This is the way. Right? And sometimes it's hard. You know, some of you guys think, oh, he doesn't listen to anyone. I listen to Pastor Keith. But sometimes I have to say no to him. He not Holy Spirit. Close to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? Most of the time he's right. But even then I have to be like, you know, you know, Pastor Keith's like, oh, I love pressuring young pastors. Amen. Spiritual gift, right? right? He's like, do this, do that, do this. What about this? What about that? I'm like, ah. And then, and then I'm like, no. This is the way. Right? This is the way. But some of you, you've never had that moment. You've been living 10, 20 years like hamster wheel. You're like, this is the way. That's the filling of the Spirit where you get this crystal clear clarity, this is what I'm supposed to do, right? This is actually one of the favorite effects of the Holy Spirit 
filling me. So summary, Holy Spirit filling helps us to experience God's love. Holy Spirit filling helps us to do God's work in God's power. Holy Spirit filling helps us to truly obey God. Holy Spirit filling helps us to have crystal clear clarity about God's will. Brothers and sisters, this is why the Bible says the filling of the Holy Spirit is not an option, it's not a taste, but it's a command that must be obeyed. Amen? Right? It is not a taste. Oh, you know, those are just for some charismatics. No. This is not an option. Oh, you, you do you, I'll do me. No. The filling of the Holy Spirit is a command. It is a command. This is an imperative. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be command, filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Present tense, all the time. You got to seek the Holy Spirit. All, you know, I was filled 10 years ago. I, you know, some people say this. People go, I, you know, I got filled with the Spirit when I became a Christian. Why do I need it now? You know why you need it? Because you're a leaky cup. This is sin. This is what sin does. The filling of the Holy Spirit. You leak. Have you noticed? Right? You go to young people, right? You, you, you know, uh, old people too. <laughs> you remember when you went to retreats? You guys remember retreats? Right? What happens at retreat? You get filled, right? And then what happens? It all leaks out. Right? You know, like some of you, you, you know, uh, you went to encounter retreat, right? You got filled with the Holy Spirit, didn't you? And then you met your wife and it's all gone, right? Right? I mean, it leaks. This is why you got to constantly fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. Right? So how do we do it? How do we fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit? You got to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, amen? Deserving of worship and honor and glory, power. He's God. He is God, equal with Jesus and the Father. Right? He's not just something you add on at the end. See, that's the problem. We experience the Father's love. We see, the, we see Jesus' truth. We never get to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of churches built on truth. A lot of churches built on love. I want us to be a church that's built on truth, love, and power in Jesus' name. Right? Let's see some power. You have to desire the filling of the Holy Spirit. You have to want it. You have to desire it. You see, brothers and sisters, my greatest service to you as a pastor is not that I work hard. It's not that you know, I'm smart or intelligent or knowledgeable or wise. It's not that I have a lot of experience. It's not that you know, like, like I spend a lot of time. Those are all important. You know the greatest service that I can do for you as a pastor is to be filled with the Spirit. That's the greatest thing. That's my, I, if I truly love you and I truly want to serve you and I truly want to be the blessing that God has called me to be in this very special role, that means what I should commit to above all else is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Confess and repent from anything that grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit. Right? Because he's often quiet. He's gentle. It's easy to ignore him. Ask people to pray for you all throughout the book of Acts. Often, the Holy Spirit was received when people laid hands on each other and sincerely asked God, who loves to give and believe, have faith, right? Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by a son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Even if earthly fathers love to give good gifts, don't you think the heavenly father would love out of the generosity and the overflow of his heart, give the Holy Spirit to his children who what? Ask him and believe in the goodness of the father. Right? You know, brothers and sisters, um, I came from a tradition where the Holy Spirit was not emphasized. I came from a tradition where, honestly, in our practice, it was Father, Son, and Holy Bible. And there are a lot of good things. I'm not saying, you know, it's, it's bad. There are a lot of good things. I think a lot of who I am is because of the wonderful training that I received because of that. But often, my life was dry. Often, my life was intellectually based. 
And one day, you know, I think I shared this, Pastor Keith said to me, you can't just be open to the Spirit, you have to pursue the Spirit. You have to desire the Spirit, you have to want the Spirit. You have to honor the Spirit. And I decided to do that. I decided to do that. And I've been doing it for about five years now. And this is my testimony, and I would love to keep sharing this with you as we you know, continue on in our church journey. I have experienced more miracles in five years than I did in my entire Christian life. My marriage has gotten better. My children have gotten better. My holiness has gotten better. I love the Lord more. I feel more powerful in my ministry. I feel more peaceful and calm. I know what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? And I've seen miracles. I mean miracles. I've seen people healed. I've seen marriages restored. I've seen breakthroughs happen. I've seen people fall in love with God. I've seen people where I said, you, oh man, you're never gonna be a Christian walking passionately with the Lord. Right? That's what the filling of the Holy Spirit does. So brothers and sisters, I don't want you to just have eternal life. I want you to have abundant life. Right? And for that to happen, with all our hearts, we must honor God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three in one. Amen? Yeah. So, you know, um, if people say, oh, we're Holy Spirit Church, I'm going to get mad and start talking about Jesus. <laughs> you know? If people say, oh, we're Jesus Church, I'm going to talk about Holy Spirit. You know? But we want to be radically middleized, right? We want to be radically balanced, pursuing all three in one. Okay, let's pray.